Today's episode of the No Fun City Podcast is brought to you by Quest Trade. There's a new world of investing where the fees are low and you come first. It's time to switch. Head over to questtrade.com to check out do-it-yourself, self-directed investing. Take matters into your own hands, build your own investment portfolio with a self-directed account and save on fees. Make your money work harder. Quest Trade is Canada's fastest growing online brokerage with over 21 years experience in the Canadian market, $18 billion in assets under administration, and a nine-time winner of the best managed companies in Canada. And you could rest assured knowing that your money is in good hands. They go above and beyond to protect your account with an additional $10 million in private insurance so you know your money is safe. For more information, check out questtrade.com. Just use the link in the description below. On to our show. Welcome to the No Fun City Podcast, episode 18. A lot going on in the world still. COVID days, which means more Zoom episodes, um, which kind of sucks, but it is what it is. It's a shame because we had quite a few podcasts lined up for this year and half of them kind of got canceled just because of COVID. But that being said, we got an awesome lineup coming up uh, for the rest of the year or I guess the rest of 2021 coming up. So uh, stay tuned for that. We also got some more awesome, exciting news. Uh, New website to be posted for the podcast specifically. And we got some merch going on. We got like some shirts made and they got even on the back. So we might actually start selling those once the website goes up. And that being said, we're going to introduce our guest for today. He is not only, I guess, a tree planter in some cases, but also a documentary filmmaker. He he had a plan, I guess the plan was, or in the documentary, they talk about planting one million trees. So joined today with me is Everett Bumstead. I said that correctly. Thanks for having me. You said it right, yeah. Yeah, thanks for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. I watched your documentary, really interesting, enjoyed it a lot. It's about 40 minutes long. You could catch it on CBC Gems, which I guess is like a side thing that CBC does or what? Yeah, it's their new streaming platform. Uh, so I think more and more of their stuff is transitioning to like that online streaming world. All right, cool. Awesome. And is that the only place your documentary is posted or is it like found other places too? As of right now, yeah, just on CBC Gem. So, and that's it's geo restricted to Canada. So we're in the process and hoping to get it more out there to the world soon. Okay, cool, awesome. So um, I'm going to put a link to the whole documentary down below uh, in the description of this podcast. So if you're watching it on YouTube uh, and you're interested in the documentary uh, One Million Trees, uh, you could go check it out. Link is in the description below. But let's talk about this documentary. So. How did you even get started into making a documentary about planting trees or tree planting? And I got to be honest with you, before you get started, I marked it uh, nine minutes and 23 seconds of your podcast is the time it took for me not to want to tree plant ever. <laughs> the nine minute and 23 second mark, it, it looks grueling, but why don't you tell uh, the people more about the documentary itself and just tree planting in general? Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, so th- I, I got into the idea of making this documentary from my own experiences planting. And I got into planting basically uh, just as a summer job. I had just finished film school, kind of had some student debt. I'd heard you could make a bunch of money really quick working in the woods in Canada. And the, it sounded interesting. Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, I went from Vancouver to Alberta. And I joined and you get, you go into a bush camp and uh, the work is grueling. Like you say, it's, it's piecework. So you get paid per tree. So that means you're trying to plant like 2000, 3000 trees in a day, which is a lot of uh, bending over, basically a lot of weight on the knees, a lot of just walking through um, hectares of like open space on these like cut blocks. So you're working in places where, trees have just been harvested from logging in, in the previous year or two. Um, so you're like climbing over like downfallen tree trunks and branches and sticks everywhere and in, in the mud and, you know, dealing with all weather conditions and, and wildlife. And uh, it's, it's a, it's a crazy job. And it's uh, yeah. Uh, I, I thought from the experience of doing it, that there wasn't really any, you know, solid, uh, 
documents of this that were made for just the consumer, for people to understand what's going on here in the backwoods of Canada. So that's where it all came from. Yeah, and I mean, watching the documentary itself, it was, I learned, I did learn a lot about the tree planting culture. And it seems like one of the big things is how many trees have you planted? And there's some people like 3 million trees, you know what I mean? Which is pretty crazy. How many years does it take to, for somebody to want to plant a million trees? Like, let's say you go out on a tree planting, uh, I don't know, let's call it an expedition uh, for one day. How many trees can like the pro planter plant in one day? How long does it take to get to like a million? Oh, yeah, like I think how long it takes to get to a million is like minimum six or seven years, but that would be like exceptionally fast to plant a million trees on one day. Uh, some of these people can plant like, and it ranges in the provinces in, in BC, you're planting in much more difficult ground, but you know, like a top tier level planter in Ontario would be planting maybe 5,000 trees in a day. Uh, versus the same kind of planter in BC is maybe around 3,000 or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, in my first season, I planted around 120,000 trees in my first season. So you can imagine from there, you're looking at about eight. On that pace, I'm looking at like eight or so seasons to get to a million. But yeah, you're right. There, there are people in the documentary who had planted like 7 million trees. And I didn't really think that was possible uh, when mm -hmm. I started this project. I, I didn't know there were people out there who had planted that much. So, And those it's... ones seem to be the people who have been doing it for quite some time. And they're usually a bit older at, that, at this point in their lives, right? Definitely, yeah. And so like I did kind of the, the main tree planting season, which is from May to July when I, when I did it. But like the really diehard uh, guys like that will will do it for like nine months of the year, traveling from the coast of Vancouver Island into the interior of Canada, you know, often going all the way to Ontario and then back again for the fall in the coast. And so, yeah, if you work six more months in the year, you could you could probably be doing 300,000 a year. And I'm sure that's what some of the, the people who have those crazy high numbers, they're probably doing 350,000 a year for mm -hmm. decades to get to those numbers. Jesus, that's crazy. Um, yeah. Definitely through the documentary, you learn that there is this uh, tree planting culture, which I guess isn't surprising in a sense. But in a way, I did notice uh, a lot of similarities between the individuals who were planting trees. A lot of them uh, stated that they felt lost or lost in life. That was something that came up a lot. Another, like a lot of other people said, oh, I just wanted to pay off my student loans. <laughs> and then I just kept doing it. Um, what, like, can I go to one of these tree planting, I don't know, places and find someone who isn't potentially somebody trying to pay off some debt? Or somebody who isn't lost like is there that odd variable where you go up there and there's just someone who's doing it this summer who happens to be maybe i don't know not lost in life um or are those I few and far so. between i yeah i think there are some people who who really have it together and uh and still come and do like tree planting seasons as like um uh, almost like a summer vacation they'll they'll go and do a month of tree planting mm -hmm. um yeah i think the, the, it's definitely a commonality of this thing about people being lost and like a um a younger generation paying off loans but i do think that you get all walks of life doing it some people who were maybe an ex-geologist that was disillusioned with their industry just wants to like um have a change in their life and and tries it out or you know, a lot of like ex oil rig workers, you know, aren't happy with the culture in, in that scene. And, and so they just cross over. And I think people who do piecework and people who do a lot of work outside in, in the in the in the bush kind of, I think um, there's some of those that just just try it out in their journey as trying a lot of different trades, I guess. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, like, how much money can someone expect to make planting trees on, in one season? Let's say you're you've done it a little bit. You're you're decent. Maybe you're not like the quickest, but you're not the slowest. You're kind of in the average. What are we looking at? I think in the average, um, and and not counting your first season because 
it's notorious that in your first season, it's hard to make money. You're learning how to do it. You mm-hmm. have to kind of invest. You have to buy your tent and your shovel and all these things. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, after a couple of years, if you've been into it, I think average people are making like 10 to 15 grand in like two and a half months or so. Okay. So not bad. Like yeah. decent money. Yeah. And then you get a remote work site allowance in Canada. So if you're, I think it's like 150 kilometers from the nearest like hospital, um, your taxes are significantly less on your own, on your earnings. So there's mm. that as well. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah, yeah. So you don't get taxed as hard on it, um, but it's exactly. seasonal. So you, it's not like you could do this all year long. Um, from what I kind of got from the documentary, it goes, I believe from early spring to end of fall. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. So yeah, you do get also then a lot of people who, uh, the people who do this year after year, um, you know, they, they, there's a joke, they call it the EI ski team. And so like after they're done, cause it's a seasonal job, you qualify for employment insurance mm-hmm. in Canada. And so a lot of these people <laughs> will just move to Nelson, you know, and, uh, and spend the winter there. Just okay. kinda, yeah. That's, that's part of the lifestyle there. Shh, we won't tell them. <laughs> Don't say yeah. anything. Um, I'm sure they're listening. <laughs> what's so here like i mean in the uh documentary i don't want to give too much of the documentary away there are some key points i do want to talk about though uh there's one point where you talk about mental toughness and uh versus the physical right a lot of people talk about how or spoke about how um the mental toughness it's what is what gets you it's not the physical aspect do you find that to be true and what where are the toughest parts of that job i mean other than being outside being cold being in the rain being hot doing laborious work like is there anything specifically that stands out yeah i think it's a it's it's a pervasive uh like it's just everything's weighing on you kind of constantly from the early mornings uh to dealing with the weather i definitely found that was my experience is that um feeling getting to points where i'm at where i feel like i'm at i've pushed my body to its limits um, but then realizing and, and taking time to think of, of this kind of like pain as a, as just a sensation. Uh, I think a lot of tree planters find that, learn that from the job uh, is like, is, is yeah, like the, the act itself isn't that hard. It's not that difficult. So um, if you can, if you can push yourself to wake up every day and, and stay motivated, I think a big part of it is the peace rate that like, if you just show up, and you're there for eight hours, but you don't plant any trees, you don't get paid anything. But if you show up and from 7 a.m. you try your best, you're going to make a, a nice wage at the end of the day. So it's, it's being able to get up early in the morning and do that every single day over and over when no one's watching as well. Mm-hmm. And when we talk about being in the middle of nowhere, there's apparently no like toilets. How do you guys shower? Like what? Yeah, there is a, so in most camps that I've worked in, they'll have like a shower trailer. So um, they'll, they do have like some running water at the camp and you can get a warm shower in, but in the places where you're working, uh, yeah, there's no, there's no uh, outhouses or anything. Back at the camp, they have like outhouses where you can use the bathroom, not usually too pleasant, but uh, yeah, when you're at work, it's, you're in the, you're in the bush. So the, mm-hmm. it's all uh, natural. <laughs> Do you know, like, as far as stats go, like, how many trees are planted annually, like, at these, I guess, like, camps and these uh, tree farms, I guess you can call them? Yeah, I know that um, this year was the biggest year for Canada so far. And what I've heard is that they're, they think it's around 650 million trees planted across the country. Oh, wow. And I think it's over 300 million of those in BC. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and that's, uh, that's with the COVID season. So that's despite a late start and despite extra restrictions and all these, these things. So it's, it's a crazy number of trees planted every year here. Can anybody just get up and go decide to plant trees and they, they just automatically get hired and whatever. And is there a limit to each camp or is it just whoever comes, comes. And if we have 10 people, we have 10 people. If we have 50, we have 50, we could accommodate for as many people as possible. I, yeah. I'd say pretty much anyone can do it. I think the companies work at trying to like filter people out. They try to like, um, 
you know, not hire people who uh, don't really have, have any idea what to expect because you don't want to spend the money to get these people 300K out into the bush and then have them, you know, uh, just backing out right away. Exactly. So they have to really try to like uh, get people aware and they, they look for people who are also athletes and these kinds of things. Okay. And, and then the camps, they range and, and like a, a supervisor of a camp will use the number of planters they have uh, just basically to, to do the tasks at hand. Like it'll really fluctuate, but most camps that I've worked in have been around 60 people. Mm-hmm. But then towards the end of the season, you know, say we have an extra three or 4 million trees that need to be planted by the end of July, then the company will just move people from another camp and and then you'll have 80 people in your camp for two weeks just trying to like finish oh, okay. off these trees okay yeah but let's say like 60 people were at a camp um and then like 20 more people just want to jump on board that's okay or is it kind of like oh we're gonna send these people somewhere else they probably would send them somewhere else with that okay. with that much because at that point then you're looking at there are situations i've had too where you get like 20 people joining your camp to finish it all off but then all the people who have been there for months get kind of annoyed. They're like, well, they're stealing our trees. This uh, is my money that I was going to make over the next few weeks. And now they're taking it out of my pocket here, right? Okay, okay, I see. So there's yeah. kind of like this middle ground that they have to work with where they're not sending too many people, you know, to yeah. get the job done. And it's always holiday. fluctuating with people like just leaving, bailing, going home, and then you know, people having epiphanies halfway through the summer and they're like, I want to come out and join you guys. It happens a lot for sure. Okay. And then like, can you leave at any time? Let's say I go there, I'm there for like a week and I'd be like, okay, I'm done. Like I did my tree planting. I, I got like a week's worth of cash. I'm good. Unfortunately, I mean, it's seasonal employment. So uh, yeah, you can, you can do things like that. It's not going to help maybe your reputation, but, uh, but it happens a lot for sure. People yeah. show up and they're like, oh, I don't like the the specs of this contract. I'm going to go to, you know, buddy's camp down the road. And, oh, and so they happens. just, there are people who go from like camp to swap camps. For sure. And, and planters who work for like several different companies and they'll just hop along contract to contract, kind of cherry picking what they like and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah. So speaking on companies, because there's an interesting thing that I learned through this documentary that I didn't know, who runs all of these tree camps? like tree planting camps because it seems like it's like a corporate thing more than a government thing. Yeah. Yeah. The tree planting like environmental government thing. Sorry. I I should clarify. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's, it's, it's not, um, it's run by corporations and, uh, and they're hired usually by like government logging operations, uh, Mm -hmm. but also just like corporate logging operations as well. And, uh, and yeah, then the fact is about the environmental thing is that this is part of like policy in Canada that when you log a certain percentage of what you log has to be replanted. And that's just like comes out of the cost of lumber and of what we, the paper supplies and stuff like that. Yeah. So um, yeah, the, the reality is that the trees you're planting are being planted on land owned by paper companies and lumber companies. And the plan is for them to be cut down in 80 years or, or whenever. It's essentially and, uh, like a big grow garden, a forest grow. It is, yeah. Just and, and, and I've been in places where you're kind of at like a top of a mountain and you can see through the valley and there's just these patches of like, oh, there's like a 10-year-old patch. There's like a three-year-old patch. There's like a 40-year-old patch. And you can, from that uh, perspective, you can see it as this like large-scale kind of farming operation. Yeah. Yeah. So, which brings me towards your payment because you get paid per piece and through the documentary, it's apparently roughly between depending what camp you're on and what your contract is, 10 cents to 30 cents. Is that right? Uh, yeah. A tree. So yeah. do a lot of, I mean, cause I, I don't know how much that adds up to roughly in a day and it's, and you know, I don't know the lifestyle and I don't know the work. So do most tree planters find that it's worth it or do they think that they're still being skimmed a little bit? Because I I look at this and I'm like, hey, if these corporations are essentially paying to have this done, and I'm assuming they're multi-million dollar corporations seeing as they're flying helicopters to drop like 
trees and food and whatever, right? And to land you guys and fly you guys there and back. Do some of you get into it and then realize like, hey, uh, we're not really getting paid that much. Like you're essentially doing labor. So I'm wondering how much do the laborers of these mills, for example, make compared to the people who are planting these trees? I think that's such a good question. And I, I wish I knew the, the stats on it. But my guess and from my experiences is that um, I think, yeah, like there's a lot of people who feel disillusioned with what you're getting paid uh, in exchange for what you do for being out there and being in these crazy places. And um, I know that there's a, a lot of people who talk about the wages and the prices of trees being very similar in the 80s and 90s that people were getting around 15 cents per tree in uh, interior BC. And that's what I was getting, you know, four years ago in interior BC. And, and obviously that's not adjusted at all for inflation. So there is a lot of that. And I think that's part of the reason why I haven't planted for years and kind of why I stopped is I realized that I could make more money in Vancouver with a video camera and uh, not at cost of my body. And I think there are a lot of like good planters who are, who just go and find other career options because at a certain point, I think, a lot of people start wondering, is this really worth it? Mm -hmm. And am I just being a, a pawn in this in this greater scheme, right? Yeah. So to all the tree planters out there, I'm I'm gonna start the revolution. Here's what we're gonna do. TPUC, Tree Planters Union of Canada. Make it happen. <laughs> get a union or something, you know, where you guys get paid your worth because watching the documentary and, and just seeing everything that you guys go through, um, I was shocked. I'm like, hey, this doesn't add up because it doesn't make sense for these companies to push you guys there to do this hard work. Then the first thing I thought about was how much are the other people who work for these companies, like whether it be at their mills or their sales office or whatever else they do, their warehouses, how much do those people make in comparison to you guys? Because in my opinion, you guys should be making that same amount, you know, or if not more, depending on how much more labor you're doing. I feel like they kind of take advantage of the fact that there are these people who want to do good in the world. So they're like, oh, I could plant trees and I could make money and I'm helping the environment and so on and so forth. But the part that's kind of uh, fogged up for them that they don't see is, you're getting paid by these companies that are probably paying other people more to do maybe easier work and not in a remote environment where they can go to the bathroom in an office building or what have you. So I hope in the future, and if any tree planters are listening to this, I hope in the future uh, the group or the culture kind of adds to the company as an actual whether it be seasonal or not, but actual good, solid, respectable employment, as opposed to, hey, we're going to pay you 20 cents a tree. And, you know, and then also let's talk about the faults, because if they're not planted properly, do you get paid for that batch? Uh, so, yeah, what, what can happen with the faults is if if it's seen that your trees aren't up to par, you'll be replanting. And so that means you're going through the land and fixing all your trees and you don't get paid to fix your trees. And and you'll lose a whole day of work. If, if they say that your trees aren't up to par, then you're replanting for the rest of the day. And so your wages are just stopped at whatever you made. And I assume that happens to a lot of newbies, like new people absolutely. To, the, to the crew. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's, that's it. And I think you're so right with the comment about kind of the need for a union. And I think it's especially easy for these companies to take advantage of uh, temporary workers, uh, and young students, people who, you know, there's just a, a lot of turnaround. So it's easy for them uh, to exploit those people. There are good people who run tree planting companies as well who, who don't, but I think it's just too easy the way things are set up right now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, the funny thing is, even if uh, the tree planters did create some sort of union or get paid more, you know, who's going to pay for that is the end customer. So like the price of lumber just goes up and then it, it just bottoms out somebody else like the developer or whoever's using the lumber in the end of the day right there is a dark side uh to this that i heard, like obviously heard about through the documentary i don't know if you want to get too much into it I, I feel like this could have been a documentary on its own but like there seemed to be uh we know that uh it's a male dominated sort of field there's a you know small group of females that do go out to plant trees 
but there have been instances and this could be said i'm not targeting tree planting specifically as the culture because this could be said in every industry i guess every person like anyone could could be uh, this individual but um like sexual assaults that have occurred on camps in remote areas correct uh correct. do you kind of want to talk about that how come th- like is this a serious hardcore issue within the tree planting culture is this something that's just happened here or there kind of like it has in any other workplace environment or i don't know uh social or community environment yeah i think well so my answer to that would be that i think my my opinion is that i think it's a greater problem um with our culture our western culture as a whole that that uh leaks into tree planting uh, camps in, in the industry. Uh, in my experiences at the job, um, I have never worked in another labor job where women were, you know, considered so equally. And I mm-hmm. think a part of that is because the, the physicality required for tree planting isn't really about like brute strength where men have a, an advantage over women. Like it's helpful to be low to the ground. It's helpful to have wide hips. It's helpful to have strong legs, but not necessarily to be big shouldered and tall. Mm -hmm. Uh, That can be a lot harder on the back. So I, my personal experience is that I would see women just killing it all the time, like um, beating men twice their size and, and guys just like endlessly frustrated with, with like, how is this, you know, seemingly small girl just kicking my ass day after day. But I I think, yeah, the fact of it is that these companies just historically have have been run by men and just the tradition is is, uh, that a lot of male run companies. And so when you're in these remote environments, uh, women are especially vulnerable. And so I think when this does happen, it's it's just especially uh, uh, like it can be it makes the situation a lot scarier just being in that environment but i don't think that it's part of tree planting culture i think it comes from from our culture as a whole Um, but there was a survey conducted like earlier this year and last year um, and it and it did have some like really alarming uh results about the frequency of sexual assaults um, and the lack of reporting and and uh kind of broken chains of command when it is reported so that was definitely something that we wanted to highlight and talk about. And it was the personal experience of, of a couple of the people that we interviewed. So yeah, definitely is an important thing for us to be talking about. Yeah. I mean, like uh, that to me was the most alarming thing in, in the whole documentary. I, I actually wish there was a little more focus on that in the documentary uh, to be quite honest. I, I found that part um, not only to be like eye opening, but also in a sense, um, educational because it's not something I think about when I think about tree planting I just think like everyone's up there having a good time like helping the environment and everyone's friendly and whatever but then there's a stark aspect um to it that I didn't other than the corporation part that I didn't even know existed so um so yeah I, I I'm glad that you actually touched on that aspect in the documentary um so is there like uh any I guess government aid or support other than getting a bit of a tax break um does the government provide anything to the individuals who go out and do these tree planting as like part of an environmental bonus or anything or is there nothing added to it um i not in my experiences and not in kind of the greater like as a the industry as a whole i don't think that you see that any kind of initiative. I know that there are some initiatives in Canada about tree planting that are purely environmental, um, but I don't know a lot about those. Like I've worked on, uh, like a, I worked on a short contract where we were reclaiming like a mine site, mm-hmm. um, which is like that. I don't think the purpose of that was to log those trees. The purpose of that was to try to restore the environment, and I'm sure it's part of the protocol with the mine. Um, so it it is nice when you get to work on something like that, but it's rare in my experiences and, and, uh, and yeah, like for the most part, 
the industry exists kind of um it doesn't really have the environment at its core interest i would say okay and then going back to the documentary uh i'd assume planting trees in the middle of nowhere is one thing but filming a documentary taking cameras to those areas is another as well so were there any challenges in filming the documentary itself yeah honestly it was ridiculous uh like trying to plan a documentary around tree planting was was trying to organize chaos um because i think every shoot that we had planned was either changed rescheduled or, or canceled a lot of things like um we wanted to film slash pile burning which is a part of the the forestry process in Canada is, is that we burn the leftover debris left after logging before tree planters arrive. We burn them in these giant piles that they call slash piles and it's okay. just sticks and roots and debris and stuff. Mm -hmm. But to, to do that burning, there has to be the right amount of cloud coverage. It can't be too dry. It can't be, you know, like, um, because if there's clouds over top, all the smoke can blow into the nearest town and stuff like that. Oh, so okay. I, I think, we, we rescheduled that shoot day, I think like 10 times mm -hmm. we had one day, it was like a, a total, like just raining from the moment we woke up until then when we went to sleep, just pouring all day. And on that day we had our rental vehicle pop a tire, like 80 kilometers down a bush road. So like we had to walk first of all, like 2k into where we were filming with all of our rain <laughs> gear, you know, and like, you think you're walking two kilometers with a camera and having no safety of like water. If, if water's starting to get into your stuff, you're two K away from the nearest dry place. And then changing that tire and driving out on a really sketchy road with this like donut on the rental car was like another thing. Um, it was ridiculous, honestly, trying to, trying to plan this stuff. And some crazy stuff. I mean, like the, when the documentary starts, you, you hear a few people tell like, well, at least parts of their crazy tales of things that happened to them. One of the interesting things was like encounters with wildlife. So what, what kind of wildlife do you like encounter? Is it common to be attacked by a moose or a bear? <laughs> because it seems like it was quite a regular thing. I think, um, I think it's not common to be attacked by a moose or a bear, but it is very common to have wildlife encounters. Definitely in my four years of experience, I had, I had several occasions where um, bears came into our camp and like tore up people's tents. Uh, I definitely would often see like a bear driving to work. I had mm -hmm. like a, one of our tree runners um, had an experience where like a pack of wolves was like stalking him. Um, <laughs> and I, I like, yes, yeah, so like I saw a lynx, um, when I was planting once, uh, from the, from a truck and I saw, oh, that's cool. Um, but moose actually surprisingly are the, the number one thing that they tell you to look out for because when you're planting kind of June, May, June, July is, is like their mating season, I guess, when they're particularly mm -hmm. territorial and aggressive and, and a Apparently they are far more aggressive than bears or anything else out there in the Canadian bush. And, and they're so big and their hooves are so strong. And what they do is they stomp you, like they stomp their prey and, and their hooves are so powerful that apparently this is what I've been told is if they stomped on your arm, they would just sever it. Oh, off wow. Completely. Yeah. Wow. Well, yeah, so, like a small moose is like 700 pounds or something. You know what I mean? And that's a small big. moose, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to move that, you need like an ATV or you need to chop it up. I've seen like, yeah, not that real. I hunt, but I've seen some hunting videos of like people t like taking out mooses and then like having to drive it out of the bush. And it's literally like they just attach an ATV to it because there's like nothing else that they can <laughs> really take it out with Insane, unless they yeah. want to chop it up there. That's funny. Um, I learned that there are three rules to tree planting. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I wouldn't call these the official rules. I would, this okay. is a little bit of where, as a documentary filmmaker, I'm putting in my own input a little bit. But this, okay, those three rules actually came from. Uh, that's it's a big part of the whole inspiration from where this came from is is from a, a foreman I had in my first year, uh, who who passed away shortly after I met him in my planting season, mm -hmm. and um, and he was someone who was like extremely passionate and extremely strong-willed and he had 
these ideas and the, and the three rules of tree planting was something I got from him was this idea of, um, of its, what is it? Ethics, empathy, and uh, uh, I can't believe I'm, I'm losing it. But uh, I didn't mark an, down the three rules, even though I, I you know what? People respect. have to watch to find out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah we intentionally forgot the third one yeah. Just so you go and find out what it is. It's a yeah. teaser. Yeah, yeah. But those are things that he talked about. And he talked about like, you know, when you're out there, not just being out there to serve your own purposes, but being just courteous to other people around you and and uh, kind of having respect for, for yourself, for others and for the land. And uh, and so actually, that's this, this guy is where the whole idea for the title came from, is that when he passed away in his obituary, it said that, uh, he had just planted his millionth tree and mm -hmm. this was like six years ago. And so I started thinking about like, you know, who was this guy who made such an impression on me? And like, what did, what did those years that he spent planting those trees mean? Um, and what is that effort, you know, because normal people just don't see it. And we have no idea that that, what that means of what he accomplished in his lifetime kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That's cool though. I, I like those three rules because it was kind of like a form of etiquette. You know what I mean? absolutely yeah it's good i, I think, think that's what it was it was etiquette was it? ethics and empathy oh. <laughs> there we go yeah i, I was thinking well, about that i'm like no it's not etiquette because these are all like this is etiquette in general so i thought i was just uh you know just thinking that up but i'm glad that i said that because uh that's what it was dang still go watch the documentary either way <laughs> still go watch yeah, it. <laughs> even though there's a lot of information that you know I, I haven't given you about the documentary i thought it was amazing but um what's next on the plate for you like do you got another documentary coming up do you have something in the works or do you have anything that uh you're brewing or maybe is in your mind that you're thinking of doing a documentary about or i don't know if you're doing another documentary maybe you're going down a different path yeah well what's on my mind is actually something that you've brought up is that uh like a lot of this felt a little too short for me like Mm -hmm. um, talking on the topic of sexual assault, I don't think that we really had enough time to really go into it. I think that there's a lot of areas where it went by very quickly, like the, the wildlife encounter stories, you know, you just get little gists of them. Um, so what I want to do is make like a full length series based on this using 1 million trees as like the pilot episode and, and to do like basically six more episodes of this and really dive in and, and like, the forestry industry in Canada and, and go to different provinces and, and possibly take a little look at how tree planting is done around the world because we're a unique uh, culture here in Canada, but there are other countries that do tree planting in a similar way. And so I think it'd be interesting to document that as well. Mm -hmm. That that is that would be super cool. I actually have a couple of buddies, buddies of mine, um, Danny and Ryan from Black Rhino Creative. I don't know if you know them, but uh they do like mini doc series uh mainly based around like canadian culture too um they're actually a huge part about how i got into filming myself and they did a series called red chef revival have you heard of this i haven't no they essentially went around canada they got indigenous chefs in different communities uh and then they kind of went over that indigenous community throughout the series and then also presented like indigenous meals like moose heart or uh when i was filming with them we ate cougar cougar meat wow. yeah so uh we didn't kill a cougar or anything like that like it was it had already been uh killed and they just happened to have it so they're like hey do you guys want to try cougar meat for this one so uh the chef when i was there um he cooked cougar meat we had gone to a soyus and then they also went to like some other places out east uh, it was a really cool series same thing sort of like six six episodes or so so check that out it, it might be a good reference as to like i don't know because what you want to do is similar in the format of what they did not necessarily like the content itself right um but dude it, it was a blast i actually really enjoyed it. i only worked on one episode with them i did the drone shots but it, it was it was a great time and i learned a lot about indigenous culture that i didn't even know you know what i mean uh so yeah i, I hope you do uh I hope you do take that on because it'd be cool to see a series about, yeah, the different aspects of tree uh, planting culture. And speaking of tree planting, I want to ask you if I'm actually planting trees when I do this. 
Okay, I don't know if you know this. Like, I'm an ambassador of a cool company called Tentry. I love them. Do you know these guys? I do. I'm, yeah, I've heard of them. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, as you know, as you probably are aware, if you buy a product from Tentry, for every product you buy, you get this little tag. And then you go on their website, you type in the tag number, and you get to plant trees somewhere in the world or do some good somewhere in the world so i want to know like um if you have any insight as to how much this like a company like ten tree actually helps when it comes to uh tree planting uh or environmental aspects yeah that's a that's a really interesting question these days it's such a a trend uh for the for companies to say buy one of these and we're going to plant one tree ten tree is probably the biggest one that's kind of really known for it. And I've heard some very legitimate critiques of this idea. And I think the reason behind a lot of it is that just there's so much nuance to like how they actually uh, roll that out. Like um, how are these trees being taken care of? Cause, cause there's one thing about planting a million trees and then leaving them. I mean, only a certain amount of those are going to grow. Um, there's a whole lot involved in the in the forestry like we do um, we'll do brushing uh, so a lot of these planting companies will come back to the areas that are planted and they'll cut away like competing uh, trees and stuff that are in the areas to make sure that that these trees live um, uh, so like coning as well like just simply like the thing that people do in their garden where they put like a little fence or whatever to keep like rabbits and uh, pests away from their plants uh, they do that as well with like cones or, or um, I might have used the wrong term there, but you know what I mean? With, I know you mean, yeah. Just protecting the trees. Um, so it's really a question of like, yeah, how the company's rolling that out and how well they're taking care of these trees and what their intention is. I don't know a lot about what the 10 tree thing is, but like on this, I find it interesting, for instance, like Justin Trudeau uh, being the Liberal Party leader, promising to plant 2 billion trees in Canada. And I'm not trying to throw shade on any anyone, but at the same time, Joyce Murray is a is a Liberal Party MP from Point Grey who is married to Dirk Brinkman, who owns and operates the largest planting corporation in Canada. So it's like, who there, plants those two billion trees, and what purpose do they go to serve? There's episode one of <laughs> one million trees series, whatever you're gonna call it. <laughs> And I don't want to imply, I don't know, you know, I don't want to imply the wrong thing here too, because Dirk Brinkman has been a collaborator on our project. And he, for someone who is so invested in this industry, he talks very openly in, in the documentary about, about the cons. And he talks about uh, some, some very, like a very real point he makes, which is, which is about uh, monocrops and, and the effect that some of these planted trees have had and how they've impacted the forest fires that we're seeing and the, the pine beetle uh, outbreaks that we've had in, in BC. Mm -hmm. And he links that to the tree, the planted trees. So as someone who has overseen 1.5 billion trees, it's, it's amazing for him to talk so openly about that. But yeah, I think there are some conflicts of interest. And I think that uh, these companies, like it, it looks really, it looks a little better than I, than I, I have a pessimistic attitude of maybe is that I'm not, the book cover sure. is better than the book. Yeah, yeah, something like that. You want to hear a funny story about Justin Trudeau? Yes. I made him want to be prime minister. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain the story. It's not, it's not how you think, but I was in grade eight. I don't know if anybody knows this, but Justin Trudeau was a school teacher back in the day. Mm -hmm. And my... Uh, and, you know, he was also a part-time school teacher. So if a teacher was, uh, he was on call, essentially. Um, and in the Lower Mainland. Uh, and my teacher was ill or had surgery for like two or three days. And Justin Trudeau was our uh, substitute teacher. No for those way. Two or three days. Now, this was in grade eight. I was a little shit. Like, I was just such a little shit. And I was a bit of a class clown uh, in that year. Um, not so much after because <laughs> I learned my lessons, but, um, I, you know, like I was the type that would just joke back with the teacher type of thing. And I forget what I had or what Justin Trudeau said, but he was, at, and he was, he was cool. Like he would joke around with us and that's why, you know, you could joke around with him 
he was kind of just as he is as prime minister, just a really kind of he has this chill appearance, right? Very fun loving guy, I guess you can say. So, um, and this is totally going off trees, but I figured I'd mention it. Uh, so what happens is he says something to the class and I forget what it was, but I remember I got up and I yelled. I'm like, oh yeah, well, your dad was prime minister of Canada and all you are is a school teacher. Now I was just joking. No, no hate to school teachers. I, I love you guys. You guys taught me and stuff like, but I was, I was, just, you know, just joking around and the whole class just goes, oh, right. He he pretends to be shocked. He grabs the meter stick. Uh, disclaimer, Justin Trudeau did not beat me with a meter stick, but we were in a portable. He go he bolts out the door in the portable and like everyone kind of and he has the meter stick and we're like, what the hell? Where'd he go? Now, mind you, I'm at the back of the class by the other portable door. You know, there's two doors to a portable, right? So it's like one on the side and then one on the back. And everyone's just like standing there. It's quiet. It's like a horror movie at that point. And my buddy Jeff opens the door that he went out and he looks. He's like, he's not here. And everyone's kind of like looking at each other, all confused. Suddenly the back door next to me pops open. Justin Trudeau comes in with a meter stick <laughs> and just pretends to attack me. Fast forward many, many years later, Justin Trudeau becomes prime minister of Canada. So he totally showed me up. So I owe Justin Trudeau a, you showed me up, like, good card played. Now, I didn't make Justin Trudeau president or prime minister. I don't even know if he remembers this. But this happened. And I like to think that I inspired him to go on into his government career to become prime minister. So you're welcome, Justin Trudeau. It was meant to be. That's, that's incredible. Yeah, that's my Justin Trudeau story. Um, I hope his tactics have changed that he doesn't still try to pop out from behind the people with a meter stick. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yo, please, like, you know, I, I just want to make this clear. Like, this guy did not attack me in any way. And I don't want to, like, and I know nobody's going to think anything of this. But just in case, just in case um, anybody does, don't don't go saying that Justin Trudeau attacked somebody with a meter stick when he was in grade eight at an elm at a middle school in Port Moody. Kind of sounds to me like that's what happened. <laughs> I know that's the rumor I'll be spreading. <laughs> yeah. Don't tell anybody, but yeah, I I always like uh tell people that story because it it's kind of it's pretty funny, you know. That's Just, so cool. Yeah, it's like you know you're in grade eight so long ago and. You say that to somebody and then they totally show you up. Just like when uh, Obama told Trump, like, oh, you might be this and that and you might have, but I'm president of the United States. And then he became president of the United States. Um, That's it. Yeah. And he, Obama had a, a crowd of people laugh at him and you had your crowd of, of the class laugh at him. So, yeah. The only difference was there was no meter stick involved <laughs> in the Trump, <laughs> which is weird because you think it would be the other way around. Yeah. So real quick, I want to know, um, this was a question and we kind of touched on this, but when it goes to tree planting, like end of the day, is it more dire directed towards corporate greed, like these lumber mills and stuff, or is it more directed to actually helping the environment and the impact that you make for the future? If these trees are going to be cut down again, um, you know, wh which way of the fence are we more leaning on here? based on your experience? Um, so I definitely want to see that change. And I definitely like want to shed light on how these practices are run and, and how things might look on the inside versus what the reality is. Mm -hmm. This documentary itself was, was kind of um, came from a place which is similar to, I think the reason that a lot of, tree planters go tree planting which is this kind of like you're saying about feeling lost it's kind of this feeling of like what else like i think when you're finding labor jobs and you know entry level positions and and trying to be a find a career it's pretty hard to find like meaningful work uh that you can enjoy and i think that you know there's there's just this argument of like well at least we're putting them back rather than just cutting them down. And so the, the documentary really comes from an angle of like, of like, uh, 
what else like um we have this culture that's grown out of this industry and nothing about it is perfect but there's like some really incredible human just humanity like culture and relationships and like something really special going on with this group of people Mm -hmm. and so i want to talk about all these issues because these are the things that these people care about and these people i think for the most part they they kind of wish that it was this environmental thing which it sounds like on the outside but the documentary itself is is really about that human experience um because i think there's a bit of a um just feeling of like almost like a helplessness when it comes to the environment and, and for these people and for myself as well like like what's something that i want to do something that i can you know measure every day that can help the environment i want to be like i planted a thousand trees today and, and know that that went and, and did something good i think our whole generation we all relate to that feeling mm-hmm. um and uh and so i think yeah that, hopefully that answers the question where it comes from it does just a little bit yeah i think i'd like I feel to like you're avoiding more of a luck i feel like you're avoiding a little bit of the corporate side of things are you like, um, like legitimately do you, do you really think that this is more environmental than corporate or corporate over environment do you know what i mean though like about tree planting in general yeah 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 yeah, yeah i think it's 100 percent corporate over environmental okay yeah but i i think it exists because of an environmental reason but i think that's that's become really diluted and that Mm -hmm. it's become like a check of a box rather than like a sincere attempt to like make some good happen where people aren't looking have there been progressions in the way tree planting is done and like maybe even like the technology or the funding or uh you know like everything that goes into it like if i was tree planting 20 years ago is it the same uh loop that we've been following today or have things progressively started to change more regulations that have been for the better have come in um maybe even the tools used or the technology or you know like uh, how the tree planters are treated, like have all those slowly uh, gone for the better? Or is it roughly like you could have been tree planting in 1970 and it's the exact same as if you were doing it today. Nothing's different. I think a lot of those things that you specifically mentioned have changed. Like the tools for sure, they used to use um, basically like a pickaxe that they would swing over their shoulder. Um, and now it's just like a little... Uh, spade of a shovel like a two foot shovel definitely one thing that's changed is like safety protocol um in in the documentary you see a lot of these people wearing high-vis vests that Mm -hmm. was not the case even 10 years ago um and on that line too is like with that safety culture there's more there are like people creating awareness about sexual assault there are like workshops and talks and, and safety briefings being happened on these subjects there's a lot more accountability with i think it used to be a lot of just go out in the bush and and uh do your job and come back and now there's always a satellite phone and there's always a binder of protocol and and a a kind of like alarm system in case anyone's in trouble whistles and stuff like that um but then i did get the comment definitely from people that planted 30 years ago saying that it looked very much the same that their experiences was very much the same so I think there's a there's a slow progression going on and as well with the environmental side, like in the 70s, I know for sure that um, it was common to just plant huge areas of just like a just pine tree, just straight up monocrops. Mm-hmm. And and now we do plant like mixed species. So it was common for me when I was planting to be planting like three or four types of trees at a time. And you're specifically your contract. uh specifies that you have to plant you know like uh the pine in the higher spot the spruce in the lower spot um you know and and so you are in that way uh it's getting more like intentional and more about actually restoring the environment and there's taking into account about monocrops so they are doing they are kind of looking at uh science data geology geography um and 
Yeah, yeah, and they're not kind of making it look like a farm. They are building in a sense, rebuilding in a sense, the forest as opposed to replanting, uh, you know, hectares of just pine trees in a row. Yeah, I think so. And like another one is is back in the day that they would just clear cut huge areas and they would just square it up like a big property the way you divide property in a city mm -hmm. and nowadays when we're logging we we log in these unpredictable kind of random orders and create like corridors and that's helpful for animal habitats and because what otherwise what happens is that these deers you know have no place to hide in this giant area and and so they're hunted a lot quicker by by uh predators and now we have you know we we, we create it more it's to the idea now is to follow the pattern of like a burn like to imitate a forest fire okay um is more how we log now yeah well that's good to hear at least like you're seeing uh some progression but is there anything left that you would want um to change in tree planting or maybe like the next step as far as uh how tree planting is done or even the culture or you know uh the process the the corporate aspect like What's one thing that you really wish would uh, improve? I think, I think the the thing that gets me is is thinking of of uh, the comments Dirk Brinkman made linking these monocrops to forest fires and pine beetles. I think um, in some way there me needs to be we need to do a better job of of replanting in a, in a way that imitates how the forests grew before, you know, colonial contact. Mm -hmm. I don't exactly know how that's done. I think like we were talking about the issue of, of low wages and that a lot of these tree planters kind of get exploited as seasonal workers. But then the other kind of thing that floats in the back of my head is that if it's really highly incentivized for these people to go out and, and they know they're going to make a thousand dollars a day in the bush, then you're just going to get way more people who specifically care about money in those positions doing that job. And those people maybe aren't going to like respect every tree. They're not going to make the small, like good decisions that are like better for the, the environment out there. So I do think that it, like you, you want to create a culture and around the job of people who have like respect. And one person says in the doc to have like a reverence for what you're doing and I think if every tree planter had that kind of reverence that we could just, just by changing behavior, we could conduct ourselves in a way that could be so much better for the environment. Like it's, it's not uncommon for me to see at a tree planting camp at teardown at the end of the season, like people throwing plastic bottles in a campfire to get rid of it because it's easier than a drive to the dump and stuff like that, which is like, you know, those are just personal choices that if, mm if everyone out in the bush had a little bit more respect for their environment, then you would never make choices like that. Totally. I'm just at the end of my 30 minutes here. No, that's fine. Let's just, uh, I guess, unless you have anything else you want to talk about, we could totally wrap it up. Okay. You're good. Yeah, no, I, f I feel, I feel good about that. Uh, yeah. Right, cool. Um, so dude, regardless what you do next, uh, whatever documentary or whatever series you go into, I would love to come back one day and talk with you again and see, get an update of just everything that's going on uh, with you. And if you definitely do another docu-series for sure, um, I'm going to have you back to make sure you could talk about it and spread the word. Um, is there anything else you want to talk about or let the people know before I let you go? Um, no, I'd, I would say the same thing. I, I'd love to talk again. I look forward to seeing uh, your podcast grow and, and to uh, catch up again at another time would be awesome. I look forward to that. And just I'd say, like, uh, check out One Million Trees on CBC Gem. If you're in Canada, it's as easy as uh, Googling One Million Trees CBC Gem. It's on the website there under documentaries. So. And I'll put the link to that uh, in the description below of this video. But if you're listening to this on Spotify or Anchor or Google Play or whatever it is, um, be sure to check that out. Um, Everett, thank you so much for joining me today. Everybody, this is the end of the No Fun City podcast, episode 18. Peace out. Today's episode of the No Fun City podcast is brought to you by Quest Trade. There's a new world of investing where the fees are low and you come first. It's time to switch. Head over to questtrade.com to check out do it yourself, self directed investing. 
take matters into your own hands, build your own investment portfolio with a self-directed account and save on fees. Make your money work harder. Quest Trade is Canada's fastest growing online brokerage with over 21 years experience in the Canadian market, $18 billion in assets under administration, and a nine-time winner of the best managed companies in Canada. And you could rest assured knowing that your money is in good hands. They go above and beyond to protect your account with an additional $10 million in private insurance so you know your money is safe. For more information, check out questtrade.com. Just use the link in the description below.